It is time for um, Free Speech Friday, where we get two free-thinking um, New Zealanders and we talk about the issues uh, of the week. It's brought to you by the Free Speech Union. They are the champions of free speech in New Zealand. Uh, and you can find them at... And I need to get... I had one week where I got their, their name wrong. The Free Speech Union. And it's FSU. Let me just check this. Uh, free Speech Union. FSU.nz. That's where you find the Free Speech Union. You can join... You can subscribe, you can find out what they're doing, and if you've got a problem with freedom of speech, they will help you. All right, our two free speech participants this morning, and really good, actually, both people very much in the news, um, former leader of the National Party, now, um, I guess, the leading light of Hobson's Pledge, which is a highly controversial organisation, and also defamation lit litigant uh, Don Brash joins us. Dr Don Brash, how are you, Don? <laughs> Very good, thank you. Very good, Sean. Thank you. All Very right, well. and uh, former National Party Cabinet Minister and Auckland City Councillor, um, and a man who calls a spade a shovel with great regularity, uh, Morris Williamson. Hey, Morris. <laughs> good morning, Sean. All right, now you two know each other? Yeah, good morning, Don. <laughs> yes, indeed we do. Morning, 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 Morris. Okay, yeah. now, very Don... Well. I Don, it very well. I just want to kick off, and I haven't mentioned this before, but... An advertising standards authority decision out yesterday, and of course um, our lapdog mainstream media covered it up the wazoo, that the Hobson's pledge ads about the sea uh, bed and foreshore are somehow illegal. No, the great majority of the decisions made by the uh, complaints board uh, did not uh, uphold, up, up, uh, maintain the, the complaints. They said the complaints are not valid most for the most part, they did uphold a couple of complaints. They said, look, exaggerated a bit here and there. But by and large, we thought the the uh, decision vindicated our position. Can you run your ads in mainstream media, Don? Uh, well, that's another question. Uh, well, no, no, that is the question, Don, and you well, can't well, because yeah, the ASA that, that, says that, you can't. That That's true. Uh, and I don't know the answer to that question. Last time we tried to run a full-page ad in the Herald, the Herald said they were still reviewing their policy. Now, that was some weeks ago. I haven't yet got an answer on that definitively. But I, I suspect that there was almost nothing wrong with those that, that so-called false front ad, two, two uh, pages one and two. Almost no objection at all. And the complaints board basically did not uh, uh, uphold the, most of the complaints against that ad. Yeah, and Don, I might add, those ads and your ads run on the platform and our policy is that we believe that our, our audience and the people who read ads have got quite enough intelligence to figure out whether they agree with its messaging or not or they believe it to be true. We're also not in any way affiliate, affiliated to the Advertising Standards Authority or bound by its voluntary code of conduct. Love it. We'll continue advertising on your, your platform, uh, Sean, for sure. Thank you very much. Uh, Morris, isn't it funny? Um, whoa, 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 whoa. I deserve a bit of thanks here. Back until 1993, adverts were taken over by the Broadcasting Standards Authority. And you imagine what they would have come out with on this stuff. Oh, yes. I decided to... I decided to split them up, let it be a voluntary organisation amongst the, the industry of advertising and, and broadcasters, and they have their own code and they write it. It's got nothing to do with government. But up until about 93, uh, it was all covered by the Broadcasting Standards Authority, which is even way oh, worse. Even woker. That's right, even though I used to sit on it for one day. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, all right. Look, I want to talk about a story, and I said at the start of our show today... This is why the platform exists. We really pushed this story this week, and it's Friday now. The Herald have now covered it, and even Stuff have covered it, though inadequately. The Solicitor General, Yuna Jagos, for the first time in a decade, um, rewrites or reviews the rules and the guidelines for Crown prosecutors around how you decide or how to proceed with a case or an accusation. And there is no way you can read those guidelines without coming to the conclusion that they say because Māori have had a bad history in this country and are disproportionately represented in the wrong stats in the justice system, you should really think quite hard as a Crown Prosecutor before on how you prosecute Māori. And it mentions their ethnicity specifically. 
And I can't read it as anything but a two-tier justice system and justice not being blind. It would appear that the Attorney-General, Judith Collins, currently overseas, agrees, and David um, Seymour agrees. Um, Morris, that's outrageous, isn't it? It is, and the real way to test any of these things is to flip them around the other way. Imagine if she had put, just be a bit careful if Pākehā are involved and you don't want to be prosecuting them or give them some thought about it. Who would stand for that? Nobody. Yeah. Absolutely nobody. And if that's the case, then, then what she's done as well, I, I can't even pronounce her name, but what she's done now is, is wrong and it is just, justice is supposed to be blind, it's supposed to be, uh, you know, you're supposed to get absolutely same treatment for everybody. That This will be reversed. I am absolutely certain at some point... Well, it can't be, be reversed. Re re if she reverses it, uh, if she doesn't reverse it, she's got to go, Don. Yes, I think she does. I can't see any alternative to that, quite frankly. Uh, I don't understand the constitutional relationship between her and the Attorney General, but... Uh, I mean, Judith Collins made her position pretty clear on this stuff when she was leader of the National Party some years back. Yeah. She gave a couple yes. of very strong speeches on Haipuapua, which made it unambiguously clear that she would not tolerate that kind of racist nonsense. So I can't see how, she, how, how the Solicitor General can continue. Even, to be fair, uh, uh, the Prime Minister interviewed on another competitive program yeah. Yeah. Uh, the other day, said we cannot tolerate racial bias in the justice system. And we all so, know how loath he is to actually say anything on race in this country. <laughs> Indeed. Indeed. Yeah. Yeah. Look, no, also I've got a me, uh, no, yeah, no, Morris. I've got a quick question here. Is this woman totally tone deaf or was this a deliberate uh, advance of the judiciary to say we're independent and you this, can't control Well, it? no, here is what I think and I think this is the really interesting contextual discussion, guys. I don't think she is tone deaf. I don't think she's politicised. I think it is just an, an indication of how deep and isolated the echo chamber of what we call critical race theory is. And I think, Don, that this is the sort of thing that has been going on for 20 years in this country. And when people wake up and say, how did New Zealand turn into this? It's because well-meaning, ideologically driven people like Una Jagos have rewritten small policies like this and cumulatively they have resulted in an apartheid-type system. And we haven't, our, our news media haven't paid attention to stories like this or they have written off the people who raise concerns about stories like this as Nazis and racists. I think that's absolutely right. I watched your interview with Laura Trask uh, just a yeah. few hours ago. And I mean, the same thing permeates the arts. I mean, here's a book which patently is racist, getting an award for the best child, uh, child's book or whatever, child's yeah. book. I mean, extraordinary stuff. Morris, do you think we've died a death or our sort of fairness has died a death by a thousand cuts while we weren't paying attention because, I, to me, that's what this story speaks to. It's the old creeping gradualism. We used to play a trick at uh, university and we were sitting in the room when the lecturer was facing the backboard, two or three of us would try to sneak out and then when he turned around, he didn't notice and then two or three more and eventually he turned around and realised there's only about half as many people in the bloody room as there was when we started. <laughs> this is what creeping gradualism is. If you just go a little bit here and a little bit there and a little bit there. But think of what big uh, weighted scales look like. You can have a huge weight on one side, keep putting stuff on the top and doesn't do anything, doesn't do anything. And then one day, even a little wee token coin can tip the entire bloody thing over. And we should be very wary of that. Every time we do one of these, ah, oh, it won't really matter or, you know, that doesn't count. It accumulates. It really accumulates. And we cannot have a justice system, can we, guys? That isn't blind. That, no, does, that works like this. Yeah, that, that's right. 